Today's video, this is the sixth video in the Learn Machine Learning series. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about dimensionality reduction, principal component analysis, or PCA, and discriminant analysis. So today's video is going to be a little bit more conceptual, theoretical, compared to normal videos. And today, we're not going to be doing any coding, samples, or tutorials, right? Today's video is about giving you guys a high overview of some of the more complicated techniques in machine learning, like dimensionality reduction, PCA, and discriminant analysis. And so today's video is still going to be very hands-on in terms of the examples and the practical applications of these technologies. However, we're going to stay relatively at a, at a high level example, high level understanding, right? We're not going to go too deep into like the mathematics or complexity involved in this and these algorithms. So we're going to start off with just going to analysis, work our way through dimensionality reduction, then finish off with PCA and some practical examples. So hopefully today's video is going to be uh, pretty good, and let's get started. And once again, this is the sixth video in the series. And last video talked about some of the more advanced classifiers, right? And today's video is going to be going to dimensionality reduction, PCA, and discriminant analysis. Let's get started with discriminant analysis. Let's talk about linear discriminant analysis, another classification technique that may be useful for multi-class classification. So in order to understand why we use linear discriminant analysis, or LDA, we have to understand the limitations of logistic regression. So logistic regression, to refresh you guys, is basically when we have a sigmoid function that gives us a probability output, and then we have a decision boundary that bounces between two separate binary classes, right? So for example, I have a logistic regression classifier for comparing whether an image is a cat or a dog, right? If the image's probability is above 0.5 at my decision boundary, it's a cat. If the image uh, probability is below 0.5, it's a dog, right? And so we make a decision boundary at some arbitrary value, right? In this case, it's 0.5, but it can be anything you want as long as it's, uh, it makes sense for the problem. And so let's talk about some of the issues with logistic regression. Logistic regression is only limited to binary classification problems. In other words, only two classes, right? It's very rare or very difficult to actually implement logistic regression for problems with more than two classes, right? Multi-class classification. Another limitation of logistic regression is that it can be unstable when the classes are well separated. What does this mean? So for going back to the cat versus dog example, that's an example of a, st of a stable um, problem. Because for cats versus dogs, you can have a very clear decision boundary that divides between cat and dog, right? All probabilities above the decision boundary are dog or cat, and all the uh, probabilities below the decision boundary are, are cat or dog, right? So in that case, you have to understand that logistic regression can be unstable when the classes are well separated, right? So cats and dogs are not that well separated, right? So like cats and dogs, there's some animals or like some hybrids of cats and dogs that look really similar, right? But for some very well separated classes, it's much more unstable, right? For well separated classes. Another limitation of logistic regression is that it's unstable for a low number of examples. So in other words, if you have a really small amount of training data, then logistic regression isn't the best option because it's unstable, right? When we use the sigmoid curve for probability, it's not really gonna be the best possible example, right? So that's what I mean by unstable for low number of examples. So there you go, those are some limitations of logistic regression, right? But typically, logistic regression is a great classifier for binary classification, right? It typically does the job, and it's really cool because, right, so as we talked about last time, it uses a sigmoid function in order to generate a probability that can then be used for our decision boundary, right? Whether it lies above the decision boundary or below the decision boundary. So logistic regression is still pretty useful, but we want something better for multi-class classification. What is multi-class classification? Well, multi-class classification is when we're classifying between multiple classes, right? Not just two binary classes. So that'd be, that'd be classifying whether an image of an animal is a cat, dog, squirrel, rabbit, mouse, etc. Multi-class classification. So logistic regression isn't the best for multi-class classification. Therefore, we need a technique like linear discriminant analysis, which takes logistic regression to the next level. Let's talk about it. Linear discriminant analysis, or LDA, is a linear method or algorithm for multi-class classification problems. The intuition for linear discriminant analysis, or LDA, is that it's a dimensionality reduction technique. In other words, it projects the features in a higher dimension space into a lower dimension space. Let's break that down. What does dimensionality reduction mean? It basically means, let's take the example of a matrix, right? A matrix has some number of rows and some number of columns. If we reduce the dimensions of that matrix, we're basically taking away some of the rows and columns in our matrix, either the rows or columns, right? So that's what dimensionality reduction is for matrices, right? But for algorithms or for feature maps, for features, when we're reducing the number of dimensions for features, 
That's basically projecting them from a higher dimension space to a lower dimension space, or reducing the number of features. What linear discriminant analysis does is that it projects our features and our data from one class into another class, right? From a higher dimension space into a lower dimension space. And the way that LDA does this, linear discriminant analysis does this, is that it, it projects the features from higher dimension space to a lower dimension space in order to separate the features and classes really well. That's the goal of linear discriminant analysis, to project the features from high dimension to low dimension while also separating the classes really well. That's the goal. That that's what makes a good projection. Like you see in this graphic, it says that a good projection is when we separate the classes well, right? That's what LDA is all about. We want to project from higher space to a lower dimensional space in order to acquire that very well separated classes, right? And then a bad projection is when the means of the two classes are very close to each other, right? They're not well separated from a higher dimension space to a low dimension space. So just remember, when you think of linear discriminant analysis, just think of it as a dimensionality reduction technique where the goal is to reduce from higher dimension space to lower dimension space while preserving the classes in terms of separation, like separating them as well as possible. A bad projection is when we, when we don't separate them well, right? So that's what linear discriminant analysis is. It's a dimensionality reduction technique that helps us to separate as much as possible. How do we learn the linear discriminant analysis algorithm? There's two main assumptions we have to make in this case. Number one, we have to assume the data is Gaussian. What's the Gaussian distribution? It's your classic bell-shaped distribution, close to the normal distribution. You also have to assume that the data has con consistent or constant variance, meaning that there's no point data points or examples where the variance is out of hand, right? It's completely different. And what linear discriminant analysis does is that when, this, when you run this algorithm, it takes your data, estimates the mean and variance, and then projects it, right, from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. That's what it does. And, while, and it cannot do that without estimating the mean and variance. So I think on this slide is an example of before linear discriminant analysis and after linear discriminant analysis. And you can see that after linear discriminant analysis, based on how much we want to separate between the means, you can see that we basically draw a dividing line, similar to the support vector machine in hyperplane, right? It's really similar. It's just that now it's better for multi-class classification, and we project it onto a different axis, right? The axis and projection is really important. Because at the end of the day, linear discriminant analysis is a projection, right? It's basically turning a higher dimensional feature space into a lower dimensional feature space, right? It's a dimensionality reduction technique. So what I want you to understand is that it can only do the dimensionality reduction after calculating or estimating the mean and variance. And that it cannot estimate the mean and variance without those two assumptions, right? Well, assumption one, the data is normally or Gaussian distributed, bell shape, and also has consistent variance. So after it satisfies those two assumptions, we can estimate the mean and variance, and then we can draw that line, right? And after we draw the line, you're basically projecting our axes or our features from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. And remember, like in this graphic, a good projection is when we're separating the classes well. That's the goal. We want good separation of the classes after we estimate mean and variance. So there you go. That's linear discriminant analysis. Let's talk about it more. So dimensionality reduction for linear discriminant analysis, right? We're projecting data from a higher dimensional space for features into a lower dimensional space. And like, talk, like I talked about with matrices, you have a certain number of rows and columns. You reduce either a number of rows or columns, either one. And when we actually do dimensionality reduction, like in Python or scikit-learn, the way it's going to work is that you're basically creating an entirely new axis, and you're projecting the data onto the new axis. This new axis could be um, x versus y, right? y versus x, um, z versus y, x versus z, right? It really depends. And the way we generate or create this new axis depends on two very important criteria. The criteria is this. This is very important and very crucial to understand. The criteria for picking our new axis to project the data onto is we want to minimize the variance and maximize the distance between means. Okay, let's break this down. Why do we want to minimize the variance? Remember, going back to this slide, a good projection for linear discriminant analysis is when the classes are well separated, right? The, the means of the classes are far away and there's very little variance, right? So that's why this is a good projection. You see these two data sets? these two circle data sets, and there's a line between the means of those data sets, that's a relatively good projection because they are well separated. There's not much variance in the sense that they're very tightly packed. And those are good things, right? That's why it's a good projection. We separate it well. And so coming back here, that's the criteria, right? We want to minimize the variance. In other words, make sure all the data is clustered well together. And you want to maximize the distance between means, meaning that we want the means of the data sets, those two 
those two separate circles of data to be as far apart as possible. And when they are far apart, it's a good projection, right? There's space between them. So that's what makes a good projection, right? So when we choose our new axis to project from higher to lower dimension to lower dimension, we have to satisfy these two criteria, right? Minimize the variance, maximize the distance between means. Those are the criteria for picking an axis. And after we satisfy those two criteria on, and we have our new axis, we then project the data onto that new axis. So let's break down this process in, these, in this graphic. So start on the graph on the leftmost side of the slide. So this first graph is basically our initial data set, right? This data set basically shows all of the data points in our data set, just like, just like the way they were, right? Our original collected data, x1 versus x2. So if you jump to the next graph, what's going on here is that we basically, so actually just jump to the third graph, and you see in the third graph that for this exact same data set, we've drawn a line that gen generally separates the data points. And what we do is that from that line, we take the distance from each point to that line. And that distance from each point to the line is going to turn into our new value. That's our new data point, actually. The distance from the actual data point to the line, that's our new data point. So then we put that into the second graph, right? And then if you take that graph and make it linear, just make it a line, then you get the final output, linear discriminant 1. That's how linear discriminant analysis work. You start off with your data. You draw some kind of separator. You calculate the distance from data points to the separator. This new value is basically going to be turned into its own data, right? And then that separately is your linear discriminant analysis, right? And remember, the way this works is that we minimize the variance and maximize the distance between means. That's why we do this whole process of basically making the separating line, calculating the distance to that line, etc. It all makes sense. It's intuitive, right? And the way that we create the axis and project the data onto the new axis is through those criteria. Without satisfying the criteria, it doesn't work, right? That's what dimensionality reduction for linear discriminant analysis is based on. Without that, it doesn't work. And remember, we're projecting into a lower dimension, right? The overall idea here is that we took two-dimensional data, x versus y, and we're able to turn it into a one-dimensional data, just a line, line of data, right? And the way we're able to do that is that we, we pick our new axis based on minimizing the variance and maximizing the distance. We project that onto a smaller dimension. We go from two dimensions to one dimension, and we get our final output, right? The one on the rightmost, right? That just that simple line. That makes sense. And there you go. That's how dimensionality reductions for linear discriminant analysis works. Pretty intuitive. Let's visualize this more. Let's do another example. So we start on the left, top left, right, with that graph. That graph basically just shows two, two, um, just one data set in two dimensions, right? X versus Y. And you draw a separating line. That's always how we start. We start up. We start by drawing a separating line. And then the next step is that we're going to transform our data, as you see on the top right graph. And then, like I said, like we did last time, you find the distance, right? You have to find the distance. Without finding the distance, it doesn't work. So then you find the distance from each data point to that line. And this distance for each data point is going to be our new data points, right? This is going to turn into our new data points here, right? With the new axis. This is very important, right? And then this final new axis is very well divided. You see this? We can now easily make classification classifi classification inferences from this data because it's well separated, right? And that satisfies the goal. Linear discriminant analysis wants to have the means of these two data sets be as far from each other as possible and to minimize variance, right? These is not there's not much variance, right? Very low variance generally. So that satisfies our criteria, right? Coming back here, minimize the variance, maximize the distance between means. It all makes sense, right? And that that that, that it's pretty intuitive, right? Because if you think about it, it's pretty simple. You draw a separating line here, right? Then you transform the data, and after you transform the data, right, you're calculating the distance from the separating line to each data point, and then you're going to take that final value and then just lay it out on a line, right? And, and there you go. That's how it works. You're taking two dimensions, x versus y, and reducing it to one dimension. And there you go. That's linear discriminant analysis. So I think dimensionality reduction is really important in machine learning as a whole, so we're going to talk more about it beyond the scale of linear discriminant analysis, right? And linear discriminant analysis is a part of a field of discriminant analysis, right? There's also factor analysis. There's also a covariate analysis, etc. You don't have to know that. But I just think it's really important to understand this process of reducing from a higher dimensional space to lower dimensional space because it's easy, right? It's something that's really useful, right? If you, if you know linear algebra or take any courses in uh, like um, high dimensional math, then you probably know that it's really difficult to deal with, uh, with numbers and matrices and like values in higher dimensions, right? 
So taking something complex in higher dimensions and simplifying it to something simpler in a lower dimension just makes life easier as a whole for everyone, right? And remember, let's just review a bit. It's all because of this criteria. We're minimizing the variance and we're maximizing the distance between means. And without that, we can't really create our new axis and project the data, right? We, we have to satisfy that criteria. And the overall idea on a really high level with linear discriminant analysis is that it's a dimensionality reduction technique, right? You're taking the data from a higher dimension space and you're projecting those features into a lower dimensional space. And I think this graph is a perfect example, right? Because you get that good projection, right? You're separating the class as well and you're satisfying the criteria. So there you go. That's linear discriminant analysis. Let's cover dimensionality reduction more. So just I think um, it's important to explain this in from broad terms for machine learning. Um, so for linear discriminant analysis, we talked about dimensionality reduction as taking um, basically a data set in two dimensions and finding a way to project it onto an axis in only one dimension. But overall, what dimensionality reduction means is just in the name, right? Reducing dimension, dimensionality reduction. Reducing the dimensions of your feature set. That's what it is. It's pretty simple. And why do we do this, right? So I think I explained it a little bit earlier, but let me, let me clarify that. So what's the issue with higher dimensional data? Like, why is it not good? As good as low dimension data? Well, it's because of this problem. It's known as the curse of dimensionality, actually. That's, that's t actually the, the term that we use in the community for it. So the idea is that a class classifier accuracy becomes saturated, or it actually decreases upon addition of features, right? Each feature is another increase in dimension, right? So remember, I think going back to the very, very first lecture, I think we talked about the idea of a feature vector, right? How you can represent the different features as one vector. So if you have, if you're classifying between cats and dogs, let's say your features are a number of whiskers in color. That's two features, right? Let's say we add another feature. That takes our feature vector from a two vector to a three vector. So there we go. We've increased the dimension, literally. So there you go. That makes sense. So what I'm saying is that features correspond to dimensions in higher space. And now take a look at this graph here. So this graph is basically measuring classifier performance versus dimensionality, where dimensionality is number of features and classifier performance is just measured in terms of the how accurate the classifier is. And it's really interesting to see that initially classifier performance increases rapidly, but up to a certain point, right? Then you get an optimal number of features, your maximum. At this point, this uh, local maximum or absolute maximum, you basically maxed out your classifier performance, which is good. But then you add more features or more dimensions, you increase your dimensionality, and boom, your accuracy starts going down faster and faster. And that's bad, right? So there you go. Classifier, classifier accuracy becomes saturated or actually even decreases upon addition of features beyond the optimal number of features. And that's what the issue with higher dimensional data is. We reduce the dimensionality or number of features in our data in order to basically get to that optimal number of features or, or somewhere near that, right? We don't want to have data where basically we're all the way here, right? We're all the way in basically a spot where we have so many features that we're compromising our classifier performance when we could actually do dimensionality reduction and get somewhere here, right? Somewhere where we, our classifier performance is really good, right? For a lower number of features, a, re, a dimensionality reduced number of features. So there you go. That's why we do dimension, dimensionality reduction. It's all about reducing the number of features in order to get close to the optimal number of features, which in turn improves classifier performance. So it makes sense, right? That's the problem we're solving. So let's talk about the relationship to some more broader machine learning problems. So we discussed overfitting in the last few lectures. Overfitting obviously is when um, you're becoming more and more dependent on the training data that on test data, the model actually performs very poorly, right? And going back to this problem, when you increase dimensionality, the reason your classifier performance goes down on test data is because you're more likely to overfit. And that's because you're becoming increasingly independent dependent on training data. And so in other words, you can translate, translate this to more features equals more likely to overfit. More dimensions equals more likely to overfit. Same thing. And that's why this is bad. That's another reason why we do dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction is also usually done in, to prevent chances of overfitting. I think this graph demonstrates it pretty well. So this graph is basically showing two projections of a data set. And so one is using principal component analysis, which we'll talk about shortly. And the other one is using linear discriminant analysis. And I think the idea here is that whatever kind of dimensionality reduction technique you use, one of the reasons we do it is to reduce the chances of overfitting. And there we go. And another takeaway here is that the more features and the more dimensions we have in our feature vector or in our, our problem space, it's bad because we're more likely to overfit. And we, in turn, we are basically decreasing our classifier performance or accuracy. 
on test data. So that's not good, right? And that's the relationship to overfitting. Let's talk about principal component analysis. And this is a topic that's very um, popular in linear algebra in terms of as a dimensionality reduction technique. It's also a very technical math-heavy process, but I'm not going to go into the math and linear algebra today. But today I'm going to give you a high-level overview of principal component analysis, some of the vocabulary in it, how it works generally, uh, how, how does it relate to dimensionality reduction and machine learning. And then we're going to talk about uh, an example, a really practical example of the role of principal component analysis. Let's get into it. What is PCA? Principal component analysis, or PCA, is when we basically rotate and project the data along the direction of increasing variance. So there you go. Right from the start, we basically have already found our criteria for this dimensionality reduction technique. Every dimensionality reduction technique has its criteria for how you project the data onto a lower dimension axis, right? In a linear discrete analysis, LDA, the, the component that we want to maximize is that we're maximizing the component axes for class separation, which basically, going back to a linear discrete analysis, means that we want to minimize the variance and maximize the distance between the means of the two separate sets of data. There you go. That's the criteria for LDA. So for PCA, the criteria is now that we're maximizing the component axes that maximize the variance. There you go. So PCA is all about maximizing the variance on the component axes. LDA is all about maximizing the component axes for class separation, which is basically minimizing variance and maximizing distance between means. There you go. And why is it called principal component analysis? Well, it's called principal component analysis because the term principal component or principal components means the features of maximum variance, right? And we use principal component analysis only for continuous data, usually, in most cases. And it's really important to draw the separator early. Linear discriminant analysis, it's all about minimizing the variance when we project onto a new axis. Principal component analysis is all about maximizing the variance when we project onto a new axis. So there you go. That's the clear distinction that I want you guys to make. Let's talk about an example. So here we have an original data set and output from PCA. So what's going on here? So in this original data set, we have some arbitrary data, x versus y. And then we transform this data and we project it onto a new axis with principal component analysis. So why is PCA useful in this case? Well, in this case, what PCA has done is that we've eliminated dimensions, right? And so you see below the, the two graphs, you see two number lines, right? Below both of those graphs. And for each number line, you're basically plotting x versus y. And then we do principal component analysis, right? We do PCA. And PCA outputs two comp doesn't output x and y. It outputs two principal components. Principal component 1, PC1, and PC2, principal component 2. And these two principal components are basically when we see the data along one new dimension, one new projected axis. That's what PCA is all about. We want to satisfy a criterion of this in this time, in this case, maximizing the variance. As soon as we maximize the variance, we project onto a new axis. And so each time we project onto a new axis after maximizing the variance, it's known as a principal component. Principal component 1, principal component 2, etc. PC1, PC2, etc. And there you go. That's how PCA works, right? You take your original data set, X versus Y, or maybe X, Y, Z, whatever, whatever the number of dimensions. We run PCA on it. We basically check the condition for whether we want to maximize variance. And if that's true, we basically form two completely new projections on two new axes. PC1, PC2, and it goes on and on, for demanding, depending on the number of dimensions that you have. And there you go. So from this, I think PCA is really useful in statistics and uh, data science because it's a really good measure of variance and statistical correlation in the sense that you can really see like outliers and uh, different ty different types of trends with PCA. It's a really useful technique in statistics and data science. And obviously it is really uh, heavy on the linear algebra and on the dimensionality reduction, but that's why it also relates to machine learning, right? Because it's another example of a very useful uh, machine learning dimensionality reduction technique for real life applications as well. Let's keep going. Let's talk about a really practical example. And since we're nearing the end of the video, let's talk about this. It's just a pretty real world example. So let's talk about it. This example is basically that we have data on the average consumption of 17 types of food in grams per person per week for every country in the United Kingdom. There are four countries in the United Kingdom, right? We have England, North Ireland, Scotland, Wales. These are the four countries in the United Kingdom. And this is basically a table of food consumption trends in grams per person per week for a bunch of different, 17 different types of food. So alcoholic drinks, beverages, meat, cereals, cheese, confectionery, fats and oils, fish, fresh fruit, you get the idea, right? 
And so this is completely raw data, right? You have 17 dimensions, 17 features, or 17 different uh, classes, and you basically have data for each of these countries, right? And what we want to do is that we want to apply linear discriminant analysis, sorry, not sorry, PCA to this data set. We want to apply principal component analysis to this data set to better understand it, better visualize the trends, outliers, everything that's going on with this data, right? And so let's see if we can use PCA to basically eliminate dimensions to emphasize how much these countries really differ. Because at first glance, when you look at this table, you don't really see much, much difference, right? I mean, so certainly the values are not the same, right? There's definitely a difference, but you can't really make out any clear trends, right? So we want to use PCA to reduce this problem from 17 dimensions to something more manageable, right? Something maybe along one axis. And so what we can do is that we can try to graph each principal component, right? Each different um, axis when we maximize the variance, right? So we may have to make sure we maximize the variance, just like any PCA problem. And then we can graph each principal component to get a better idea of some of the trends, some of the data um, uh, patterns that we see in this example. Let's see. So here's the plot of the first of the data along the first principal component. And you can already tell something is different about Northern Ireland, right? And so how do we get this graph of the first principal component? Well, it's basically from if you go back to this data set, you basically look at the data, 17 dimensions, and you're going to try to see the interesting variations in this data set. Where do we see interesting variations? You can find which foods basically have the most variation or the most widespread variation, right? Remember, you want the maximum var variance, right? Going back to PCA's main technique, features with maximum variance are the principal components, right? So we look at the features, right? Or basically the class of beverage or food that has the maximum variance. And then from that, we can graph each principal component as we go. So PC1 was graphed based off, I, I'm not sure which of these it was, but it was one of those foods, right? With the maximum variance. And so there's the plot of the data. And then there you go. You've already starting to see some trends. We can already see that something is different about Northern Ireland for PC1. Then we graph the next principal component, right? And you graph it as Wales, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland again. And now you see something is very distinct about Northern Ireland, right? It's completely different from the trend. And so now we see that Northern Ireland is a major outlier. And if you go back and look at the data in the table, this actually makes sense conceptually and physically, right? Because it makes more sense, right? The Northern Irish, they eat way more grams of fresh potatoes they, I think it looks like the uh, few fresh fruits, cheese, fish, and alcoholic drinks. So this is a really good sign because what we've done is that we've taken some basic data on the food and beverage amounts, and we've translated that to real data with a physical, real-world geography meaning. And we've actually visualized reflex, reflections of a big fact in the real-world geography. Why does this data make sense? Well, think about the United Kingdom. England, Scotland, Wales all lie on the same island, but Northern Ireland... It's not on the island of Great Britain, actually. So there you go. There are, you basically we basically made our difference in real world geography based on the data in these trends from principal component analysis. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how useful PCA is, right? And so beyond machine learning, it's just really a really useful statistical technique that allows us to visualize trends in data based on maximal variance, right? That's what PCA is overall. And the connection to machine learning is that it lets us use uh, basically lets us uh, take uh, feature maps or feature vectors and translate them to much lower dimensions, right? That's the goal there as well. Let's conclude this lecture. So we started by talking about linear discriminant analysis, LDA, and it's more advant advantageous to logistic regression for multi-class classification. The way it works is that it projects data on the criteria of minimizing variance and maximizing the distance between means. Uh, we talked about dimensionality reduction as a very broad concept in machine learning, mathematics, statistics, etc. And it solves the issue of working in higher dimensions, right? Where basically, as you work in higher dimensions with more features, your accuracy for your classifier or for your algorithm goes down, right? And as you add more features and dimensions, you're more likely to overfit, right? That's another issue we talked about. And we ended off the lecture in the last few minutes by talking about PCA. And how PCA is really cool because you basically satisfy a different condition. The new criteria is that we want the components with maximum variance. And PCA is a form of dimensionality reduction where we basically we want to satisfy maximum variance. We take the features or dimensions of the maximum variance and we project them separately as what we call principal components. And we project them on PC1, PC2, etc. And then we can graph them against each other and we can see really, really cool trends and some really interesting patterns, right? And there you go, that's PCA. And so that will conclude today's video. Um, so thank you guys for watching.
I know today's video was definitely a little bit more complicated than the usual material we cover on this channel in the series, but hopefully today's video on let gives you an idea of how broad the field of machine learning is, right? Because at the end of the day, machine learning is really just an extension of computer science, statistics, data science, mathematics, etc. So today's video is really just taking a step to understand the theoretical aspects of some of the classifiers and machine learning algorithms out there. And we took down some really complicated advanced technical techniques like PCA, and we broke them down into very practical examples and how this dimensionality reduction process actually works. And so there we go. You guys should probably have a good understanding of how that works. And so once again, thank you for watching. This is the sixth video in the series. Uh, next video, I believe we'll be covering uh, Nave Bayes classifiers in more detail. And so once again, thank you guys for watching. Um, glad to have you here. Make sure to drop a like on the video and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you guys, and bye.